Hello and welcome to the Performing Arts Series brought to you by the Kennedy Center and the Prince William Network. My name is Maria Salvador. Our program today is Telling Stories and it's my pleasure to be here with author Walter Dean Myers. Mr. Myers is the award-winning writer of over 50 books of poetry, fiction and nonfiction for young people. He's been awarded two Newbery Honors, five Coretta Scott King Medals, as well as two Coretta Scott King Honors, a Boston Globe Horn Book Honor, and received the first Michael Prince Award for Excellence in Young Adult Literature for his book entitled Monster, which we'll discuss later. Mr. Myers has also received the Margaret A. Edwards Award for his overall contribution to young adult literature. Mr. Myers grew up in, in Harlem and now lives in Jersey City, New Jersey with his family. Thank you for being with us, Walter. Thank you, Maria. Before we get started, I think it's important for the audience to hear and feel and see um, where it may have all started. And so we'll now listen and see Harlem by Walter Dean Myers, illustrated by Christopher Myers, as read by Ozzie Davis and Ruby Dee. Harlem, a poem by Walter Dean Myers, pictures by Christopher Myers. They took to the road in Waycross, Georgia, skipped over the tracks in East St. Louis, took the bus from Holly Springs, hitched a ride from G's Bend, took the long way through Memphis, the third deck down from Trinidad. A wrench of heart from Gory Island. A wrench of heart from Gory Island to a place called Harlem. Harlem was a promise of a better life, of a place where a man didn't have to know his place simply because he was black. They brought a call, a song, first heard in the villages of Ghana, Mali, Senegal. Calls and songs and shouts, heavy-hearted tambourine rhythms, loosed in the hard city like a scream torn from the throat of an ancient clarinet. A new sound, raucous and sassy, cascading over the asphalt village, breaking against the black sky over 125 Street, announcing hallelujah, riffing past resolution. Yellow, tan, brown, black, red, green, gray, bright colors, loud enough to be heard, light on asphalt streets, 
sun yellow shirts on burnt umber bodies demanding to be heard, seen sending out warriors from streets that know to be morning still, as a lone radio tells us how Jack Johnson, Joe Lewis, Sugar Ray is doing with our hopes. We hope, we pray, our black skins reflecting the face of God in storefront temples. Jive and Jehovah artists lay out the human canvas, the mood indigo. A chorus of summer herbs, mangoes and barbecue, a perfumed sisters, hip strutting past fried fish joints on Lenox Avenue in steamy August. A carnival of children people the daytime streets, ring Olivia warriors, stickball heroes, hide and seek knights and ladies, waiting to sing their own sweet songs, living out their own slam dunk dreams, listening for the coming of the blues. A weary blues that Langston knew and County sung. A river of blues where Du Bois waded and Baldwin preached. There is lilt, tempo, cadence, a language of darkness, darkness known, darkness sharpened at Minton's, darkness lightened at the Cotton Club, sent flying from Abyssinian Baptist to the Apollo. The Uptown A rattles past 110th Street, unreal to real, relaxing the soul. Shango and Jesus, Asante and Mende, one people, a hundred different people, huddled masses and crowded dreams. You've just heard Harlem, read by Ozzie Davis and Ruby Dee. The listener can, can feel the rhythm of Harlem in that poem and see the colors of it and sense the history of it. How did growing up in Harlem um, impact your writing, influence your writing? Well, it was a, at first place it was home to me, and it was a wonderful uh, community. It, it gave me a sense of, um, of again, the rhythms and um, the colors. Um, and. and these were the things I would eventually begin to write about. I would write about the, the, the sense of community. I would write about the streets and um, things which I, I did not find in books when I was young. Usually when I was, when I was a, a kid growing up, I would read stuff about um, some country uh, area, suburban suburbs. Uh, even today, you don't read very much about cities. It's true. Yeah, very, very little about yeah. cities. Your, your son, Christopher, created the illustrations for, for that piece that we just saw, and it's really rich. How did he come? He he's, he's clearly didn't grow up in the same Harlem that you did. How did he come to know Harlem, and how did your recollection of Harlem and his impressions of it come together? Uh, they didn't exactly come together. Okay. <laughs> As a turkey. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I took him, when he was, a, when he was small, I, I took him to Harlem. And I took him all around and uh, um, to various, various places that I, in which I had grown up. And I showed him uh, the Harlem, which I knew and loved. And I told him the stories about Harlem as I grew up. Um, he, uh, he had his own, own impressions. He said this was um, a Harlem that he knew through my eyes, but he didn't see it exactly the same way. And so the book was, um, his illustrations are, are really a combination of those things, a combination of what I saw and then what uh, he saw. For example, um, um, when I, would, I show him a street, to me the street had different meanings. This was, this was the street I played in. This was the st street I, I was, did my stickball uh, in. And for him, it was, it was the street that his father uh, 
talked about. Okay. You, you're obviously very familiar with, with Harlem, but does a book like this require any kind of research? It, it does. Everything I do uh, has a, a measure of research. I went back to the places. I, I, I revisited. I took photographs again to remind myself of, of what the streets were like. And, and also, uh, again, it, it's Harlem, Harlem of my youth. So I had to go back and, and remember the places that were uh, around at that time. It's true. Did, were you able to communicate your vision of, of how you wanted to research Harlem with uh, Christopher? I, I, I did. I mean, I was, uh, for one thing, I, what, I, what I, I could communicate to him was my love of that community. And that's what he was looking for in the pictures. And I, I could not communicate the exact things. He plays different games than I played. Um, he played in a different area of, of the world. Mm -hmm. um, it meant something different to him, but what he was translating was, was my love, and I think he got that. Harlem captures the drama in everyday life, uh, and there is drama in everyday life. Right. But you also found high drama in a bookshop in England. Can you tell us about how At Her Majesty's Request came about? Uh, sure. I buy um, too many books. <laughs> <laughs> I, I buy hundreds of books. I buy photographs. Um, I, I buy documents. And I was in London, and I went to the old bookshop, and I asked uh, the owner if he had anything <laughs> dealing with the slave trade. And he said, no, uh, not at the moment. But he, he did have a series of letters. And he went and brought out this pile of letters. There were 55 letters all, all together, and showed them to me. He said that these were about an African girl who had been brought to England in 1849, and uh, that, that just um, surprised me because I'd never <laughs> heard of this girl. And she had been the uh, protege of Queen uh, Victoria. And I looked at the letters, and th most of them were very difficult to read. But as I went through them, I saw there was a story there. There was a story. You made, you made Sarah, Sarah uh, Bennett, Forbes Bonetta, uh, come to life. She was clearly of, of another era. How did, you, how did you figure out what research to incorporate into this whole? Well, um, there were things I did not, uh, reading the letters, I, I didn't uh, understand. For example, <coughs> when she came to, uh, one visit to London, uh, she brought with her, she had two pounds. And two pounds, uh, which is English uh, currency, um, is not very much. So I, what I had to do was to research the, the times to figure out what two pounds meant at, at that point. And I discovered that uh, people lived, actually families lived on less than two pounds a week. And uh, sh this, this, this was her spending money as Queen Victoria's protege, mm -hmm. and that was, uh, that was amazing to me. Well, Sarah also had a very um, different life in England uh, when, she was, when she was brought over at her, as a gift to Queen Victoria. Uh, can you share with us what you thought of, how you speculated she might have reacted to? Well, one of the things that I felt that um, everything had to be so new to Sarah. It was, it was, it was, you know, here she was from West Africa, and now here she is in Victorian England. Um, Sarah, who had lived among only black people for most of her life, now had to get used to living in a completely different world. Here there were little girls with blonde hair and blue eyes, and what must have seemed to Sarah incredibly white skin? Snow. What must she have thought of snow? To see all of London blanketed by soft white flurries. To see the flakes on her bonnet when she came into the Forbes home and looked at herself in the mirror. But of all her experiences, nothing would have excited her as much as her visits to the palace and Queen Victoria. It, it, it's just a fantastically different world and, and total contrast to where she had come from. 
you use primary source material to, to develop your story. Um, tell us how you, how you organized your research to delve into the history because you, you provide a context, a context not only in terms of the, the era in which Sarah lived, but also the, the cultural and climate differences she must have experienced. Well, I had to go and look at these, uh, at, at these differences um, as, I came, as I came to them. For example, um, when she was in London, what, what, what was the climate like? What, what, what were the finances? Um, what were the, the, the houses like? What were the homes like? And I went to England and I looked at the houses and I walked through uh, some, of, some of these places. I knocked on the doors. Hello, I'm doing a book, <laughs> right? And um, uh, I hired a researcher as well. Uh, it was like doing detective work, wasn't it? It was like doing detective work. I was tracking down uh, various places she had been. Uh, in one letter, she writes that uh, Queen Victoria had moved her from one house to another and the new house was a rat hole. And I felt so bad about that, that they moved it to a rat hole. So I, uh, I went <coughs> to the quote, rat hole, and it was the most gorgeous place you've ever seen in your life. It was high on the hill, overlooking the English Channel. And it was just a beautiful place, but she was unhappy at the time. And so to her, it was rat hole. That's it, it interesting. Was, uh, where else did your research take you, your detective work, if you will? Here, I, I went to the home that she lived in. I went to the Windsor Palace that she stayed in. Um, I went to the train station where, where she was picked up one time uh, by, the, by the Queen's footman. Uh, I went to every place that I could find that she was in, 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 in England. I went to these places and looked at them, and I photographed them. She was married. I went to the church. Uh, I, walked, I walked down the uh, same aisle that she walked down. You know, it, was, it was just fun. Interesting. Didn't you, didn't you uh, actually find somebody to do some research in, in Africa for you, too? All right. I found uh, a woman who was going to do research in Africa as well. I um, went to the, um, she was educated by the um, Methodists. Sarah was educated. Right. Okay. Sarah uh, was educated by the Methodists. So I went to the Methodist archives and found photographs of the, of the schools she went to. Interesting. Absolutely. Well, you use primary source material extremely well, and I'm just going to share a, a part of a, a letter. And you, you open this letter, uh, this, you, you create uh, the context for this letter by saying, and this is quoting from the book, the letter is an interesting one, as it's the first one to describe Sarah as being formally under the Queen's protection. And then the letter, Windsor Castle, January 25, 1851. The Queen has at present under her protection a little African girl about eight years old who was brought to this country by Commander Forbes from the King of Dahomey. The Queen, having made enquiries, uh, has been informed that the climate of the country is often fatally hurtful to the health of African children, and the Queen is therefore anxious that this child should be educated in one of Her Majesty's dependencies upon the coast of Africa. Where did you find this letter? Who's it from? You know, how did it come about, and why did you incorporate it here? Uh, what, what I did, I, I needed to, to, to establish that the connection between Queen Victoria and, and, and this girl. So I used primary resources, the letters, but also Queen Victoria's diary, because I um, requested, and the people at Windsor Castle went through her diary and, and Queen Victoria's diary and took out all the excerpts which pertain to Sarah. Interesting. That was fascinating, fascinating, absolutely. As a matter of fact, one of the interesting stories, I was on the internet one day at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I just typed in, I, I work in the mornings, typed in African princess, and a photograph of Sarah came up, which shocked me. And it was a, a picture of Sarah that Windsor Castle did not know about, but that was in a collection in Toronto. And the people in Toronto did not know what the picture was, who she was. Mm -hmm. So I contacted them. I gave them the information uh, who Sarah was. In, in turn, they, they allowed me to use that in the book. And then I contacted Windsor Castle, and Windsor Castle got a picture of her oh, also. They didn't have a picture before that? They had a picture of her, but not that particular picture. Okay. 
Yeah. Interesting. So chance does favor the prepared mind. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Whatever happened to Sarah? Uh, Sarah eventually uh, married and went back to um, to Africa. Um, I'd like to read from the epilogue Please if do. I can. Uh, there are many things to wonder about Sarah. The estimate by Queen Victoria put her birth uh, in 1843, which meant she, she lived less than 38 years. During, the, during those years, there were times of grave danger, of high adventure, of soaring triumphs, and crushing tragedies. There were also many questions concerning Sarah's life, to which I could not find answers. Had she as Commander Forbes once suggested, simply erase the memory of, of her first years from her mind. Did she not remember her African name? It's difficult to sum up her life. Uh, she was both unfortunate in her losses and fortunate that those losses were not greater. She lost so many chances for fulfillment and yet received so many different opportunities. She seemed to find a measure of comfort wherever she was, but was destined to be, to be apart from the world in which she lived. Throughout all of her turmoil and triumphs, she was always forgiving in her outlook and gracious in her manner, and she remained always a princess. You use primary source material to create a mosaic of Sarah's life, um, and you weave primary source material throughout her life. How is it different than uh, researching a more contemporary uh, s subject as you did with Malcolm X or Muhammad Ali in The Greatest? It, it, it's very much the same. Uh, when I was working on um, uh, Muhammad Ali, The Greatest, uh, what I had to do was to find uh, the truth about his life. And, and in my mind, the truth about fighting, the boxing business. And so I went to boxers. I went to gyms. Um, I got hit a few times, <laughs> <laughs> which was not too cool. But uh, that was interesting because um, uh, being hit uh, by a fighter, a professional fighter, is something else again. Um, when I was, as a boxing fan, I, used, I looked at fighters and said, okay, they're different than I am. They don't, it doesn't hurt them as much. But it does, it hurts them just as much. And, um, and the, that idea of the brutality of fighting was what I picked up most from uh, this book, working on this book, the brutality of it and, and, <coughs> and his courage, Muhammad Ali's had this tremendous physical courage and uh, uh, emotional courage and perhaps too much courage for the sport that, that he was in. So you went to people primarily for your to, research? I went to people primarily. I, I, I went to any statement he's, he's ever made. Uh, I went to people, uh, I, you know, I, I, I got his birth certificate all this sort of thing. I, his birth uh, certificate, I got all the documents that I could find uh, about him. I, in my house, I even have shoe polish, Muhammad Ali shoe polish, if you, if you can, <laughs> there is such a thing. I've got Muhammad Ali uh, on, on Reedy's boxes. I've got Muhammad Ali tooth, uh, toothpaste. Uh, uh, yeah, right. He, he's made <laughs> records. He's done so much stuff. Um, uh, it's, it's really interesting. That's fascinating. Yeah. You also used people as your research mode. You, inter you used interviews to research um, a really disturbing and tough novel for which you've won many awards, Monster. Talk about how you did the research for Monster. Monster, I went to prisons. I went to prisons and I went to youth houses. Uh, the prisons were mo primarily in New Jersey and New York State youth houses. I should back it up a little bit. Monster is the story of a 16-year-old named, named Steve Harmon, who is in jail, accused of felony murder. And it's told from Steve's point of view and from the point of view of a screenplay that Steve writes. And I'm sorry to interrupt you, Walter, but it just occurred to me that 
maybe not everybody in the audience has had a chance to read Monster yet. Well, what I did, I, I went to the I went to the prisons, and I began to interview these prisoners, and I began to <coughs> to see how they um, they thought about themselves, how they described their, their their crimes. I remember talking to one guy, and I asked him. Uh, uh, about his life, he told me about his life, and he was a fairly decent guy, spoke well. And then I got to the crime, which I was always a little, you know, leery about talking about. So, what, and he said, there was a, a holdup in New York City, and there, was a, there were two cars involved, and there was a, unfortunately, there was a shootout. So I'm saying, well, I'm thinking to myself, well, what's your involvement? And actually, he had been involved in it. He had pulled a gun. He had shot two guards and killed two guys. I'm saying, he's separating himself, how he feels about himself, from the crime that he committed. And so that's, to me, that was shocking with this, with this guy. But then I kept on finding that people I that, that I'm interviewing are separating how they feel about themselves from the crimes that they're committing. So how am I going to, to put this into a book? And I decided, decided to put it into a book. When the guy is thinking about himself and Stephen is thinking about himself, he's writing in longhand and he's writing in diary form. When he begins to think about the crime, he's creating a movie. He's watching it from a different perspective. And th so this is what I'm using this. Can you introduce us to Steve Harmon in his, from his diary? Stephen um, is, in, is in prison, and it's a brutal, it's a terrible experience. It's, 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 it's much worse than anybody can imagine. The best time to cry is at night when the lights are out and someone is being beaten up and screaming for help. That way, even if you sniffle a little, they won't hear you. <coughs> if anybody knows that you're crying, they'll start talking about it and soon it'll be your turn to get beat up when the lights go out. There's a mirror over the steel sink in my cell. It's six inches high and scratched with the names of some guys who were here before me. When I look into the small rectangle, I see a face looking back at me, but I don't recognize it. It doesn't look like me. I couldn't have changed that much in a few years. I wonder if I will look like myself when the trial is over. Sometimes I feel like I, like I have walked into the middle of a movie. It's a strange movie with no plot and no beginning. The movie is in black and white and grainy. Sometimes the camera moves in so close that you can't tell what's going on, and you just listen to the sounds and guess. I've seen movies, movies of prisons, but never one like this. This is not a movie about bars and locked doors. It's about being alone when you're not really alone, and about being scared all the time. I think to get used to this, I would have to give up what I think is real and take up something else. I wish I could make sense of it. Maybe, maybe I could write my own movie. I could write it out and play it in my head. I could block out the scenes like we did in school. The film would be the story of my life. No, no, not my life, but of this experience. I'll write it down in the notebook they let me keep. I'll call it with the lady who is a prosecutor called me, Monster. It's a tough experience that Steve has in his prison. It's, it, it's, a, it's a very tough experience. It, it's, it's, a, it's brutal. I, I've, seen, I've spent a, a day in a prison um, and walked out just, just drained, drained. But is this appropriate in a book for young readers? When I was in, in the prisons and, and the youth houses, I saw kids, 14, 15, 16-year-olds, who were going to be in, in these jails for a long, long time. And I needed, I really 
felt that these are the kids I needed to reach. These are the young people I needed to reach. And I needed to leave them with, with a question about how Steve Harmon came to that decision-making process. And, and I think that if I could have reached all of these young people before they got into trouble, maybe, maybe if they had considered those questions then, they would not be in prison today. And it's, 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 it's sad. I mean, I mean, to see it, it's just, it would tell your heart out to walk into a prison. You, you, when you leave a prison, you're, you're, you're drained, you're, you're, especially with, when it's, it's the, young, the young people. And you know that the more kids hit it in, in that direction. Well, it's interesting that, s that Steve's, that the, the devices you used to present Steve's stories were both from Steve's perspective, but one from inside Steve, the other from outside Steve. Right. One was from inside, one from outside. Now, I gave it to um, my son to do illustrations. Um, I gave it to my son because he works cheap. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he doesn't. Um, and, he, and he did photographs. And he went into a prison and photographed uh, a young man. Uh, this young man is not really a criminal. Uh, this is my son's girlfriend's brother, <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, that raises an interesting question. Why did you choose to use photographs to illustrate this book? To, uh, to sort of ground it in, in, in a very hard reality. And um, Christopher uh, likes to take images and put them in a different context, you know, so that you can see them in, in, in a very fresh way. So here you have some very traditional images uh, of, of, of a young man in, in, in deep trouble, but now you know him. Now you know what's going on in his mind. You see, you see him, uh, uh, you see his mother holding up a photograph of him, but now you know something about the mother. So it's, it's, it's a different context, and it's, and it's a, very, a very hard reality. You've used photography for different reasons in your work, haven't you? Um, as research and as illustrative material. I've used, I have a collection of close to, at this point, 15,000 photographs. <laughs> right. <laughs> where, do you, where do you keep them all? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're in the basement, they're in the bedroom. <laughs> 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 I've got, I've got clo still closets after closets uh, full of photographs and, and primarily of young people families from around the world, and I use these constantly uh, um, for book, even for book ideas. Interesting. You do an awful lot of research, and it sounds like you, you do an awful lot of on-site research. When do you find time to write? What is the writing process like for you? Well, <laughs> gathering these, these materials, gathering the photographs, doing this, is all the pre-writing process. No, and so I'm, I'm pre-writing most of, of my time. I make a living pre-writing. That's, that's how I make my living, pre-writing. And then the writing is just, that's easy. That's the easy part. And I just get up every day and I write seven pages per day. No five matter how long it takes? What? No matter how long it takes, you write seven pages a day? Yeah, five days a week. Seven, day, I have seven pages, I get 35 pages per week. That's what I do. I've been doing that for 30 years. Interesting. Now, you described that pre-writing process. Um, how do you determine what you want to write about? You know, what, what are your subjects? Whatever bothers me. Now, going to the prisons, that, 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 that bothered me so much that I had to write about that. I had to get it, I had to. Um, one of the students uh, mentioned that he uses writing as uh, a way of, of looking at what he's doing with his life. And this is what, this is what happens with me, too. Uh, when I, whatever I do, whatever touches me inside, eventually becomes the material that, uh, which, uh, that I write about. Interesting. Um, how do you identify, you know, uh, the approach to take when, when, to engage the reader? I mean, do you know what I'm saying? Um, how do you know who your audience is when you're, or are you conscious of your audience when I, you're writing? I, 
I'm usually not that conscious of my audience. I mean, I'm thinking of who I am, uh, what, what I need to say. Uh, that's the first thing. In my first, I do my pre-writing, then my first draft. For example, with, with Monster, with the, with the uh, pre-writing, I, I had 700 pages of interviews. Um, I had the, the photographs, uh, trial transcripts. So I have all that material. Then I do my first, <coughs> uh, my first draft. When I finish my first draft, then I begin to think about who's my audience? Who's my audience? How am, how am, am I reaching uh, my audience? Is this writing clear? Is, is this writing something um, uh, that's going to be uh, understood by a young person? On the Muhammad Ali book, I did all my, all my pre-writing, my, my outlines, and I did my first draft, and then I felt that um, the, my original story about this great kid and how fast his hands were was well, not the real story. It was, it, was the, it was the courage, what he meant to his time period, uh, and, and fighting, what fighting was about. You know, I mean, I had a completely different idea of what fighting was, was about before I uh, started the book. Interesting. <coughs> you write different, different kinds of, of novels, different genre. I mean, different kinds of books. You write in different genre. Harlem is is a poem. Um, At Her Majesty's Request is is a biography. Monster is a novel. What kind of shifts do do you have to make to 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 create different kinds of of books, or are there? different modes that you're in when, you, when you're in the creative process. I, I love writing so much. I love what I do so much. Um, before my dad passed away, he was, he was saying, uh, what do you do for a living? Because my father did not understand what I did. And my father could not read or, or write. He didn't understand. And I said, I write stories, Dad. And he says, that's what you did as a boy. You're a man now. And the point, of, of course, is something I've always loved, what I, I've always done, what, what I'll always do. That's interesting. I've been asking a lot of questions, and, and I think our studio audience would like to ask some now. Um, would, would Hello, you? my name is Joshua Holmes, and I was wondering, what inspired you to write The Mouse Rap? Uh, my, my father, uh, when he first came to Harlem, uh, worked on a moving band, yeah. and the guy that hired him, um, th well, the moving band company was owned by a guy named Dutch Schultz, <laughs> who, who was a, um, a gangster. My father was not a gangster, no, but uh, the guy that owned the thing was, was a gangster, and he told me that story, and it was so, such an interesting story, but how then do I bring it up to a date? That was a long time ago, and I had a, I said, what, what, what was going on that was very modern and up-to-date rapping? So I brought the two elements together. Good? Say yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'd also like to let our viewing audience know that they can call with questions at 800-576-1396. But in the meantime, we have another question in our studio audience. I didn't have a, you know, a role model when I was growing up. Uh, when I was growing up, there was very, we, we did not use young adult literature uh, in the classroom, which, which, which was, um, that's, that, that's, that's a fairly recent uh, idea. Um, but, but one of the reasons that I write is because uh, when I was growing up, no one ever wrote about, about Harlem. No one ever wrote about black life. And so I wanted to write about those things. We have another question over here. Hi, I'm Brittany, and I was wondering, what was the first book you ever wrote? What's your first I did book? a picture book called Where Does the Day Go? And that was a, a contest. I, I entered a contest, and I won the contest. 
and the book was published. Um, that was my first, first book. That's interesting. We now have a call from Trenton, New Jersey. Go ahead, caller. Hi. Good, good morning. I can't hear my you. name is Ben, and I'm calling from Bishop of Charlotte. Can't, can't hear and hear at all. We have the potential from. Uh, while we're trying to get Trenton on the line, is hi. Okay, Trenton, go ahead. Hi. Good morning. My name is Miss Finney. I'm calling from Fisher Park Charter School. Hello. But I just want, wanted to know if you have books also that are all poetry related, or are they all novels? I, I, I've done. Um, the question was, do I have uh, books which are poetry related? And I've got um, a number of books, uh, uh, Brown Angels, Glorious, Glorious Angels. Angels, Angel to Angel, which are all poetry-related uh, books. Okay. Okay. And, and th those are poetry uh, combined with photographs. Okay. Thank you. We have another studio question from our audience here. Um. Who is like your favorite character of all of your books, out of all of your books? My favorite character out of all of my books? Uh, you know, I have a tendency to like the, the characters that I'm working with now. You know? So uh, um, I, don't, I really don't have a favorite. I mean, I enjoy writing about the people I write about. Sarah was an interesting person. Muhammad Ali was, you know, Muhammad Ali was <laughs> the greatest. Uh, of all the, the other, b <coughs> the, the fictional characters, they were all interesting to me. I, I think about them a lot. We have another question uh, from our studio audience. Hello, my name is Lane Herbots, and I was wondering if you prefer writing nonfiction or fiction books. If I prefer writing nonfiction or fiction, <laughs> I hate to give you a wishy-washy answer, but I love both of them. I, as, as a matter of fact, I normally work on more than one book at a time. I work on uh, two books at a time. And one would be fiction and one would be nonfiction. And I, and I join both. Well, don't you think they both tell a story? The, they both tell a story. And, and it's, it's, it's both about selecting the right elements of the story to tell um, and, and making it as, as, as real and, and as alive as possible. We have another question in our audience. Hi, my name is Cameron Hart. Out of all your books, which one, what character do you think is more like you? <laughs> most, most, most like me. Uh, I have some dis disagreement. I mean, um, there's a character in the book called Fast Sam Cool Clyde and Stuff. And in that book, I saw myself as stuff. Um, but other people will describe me in other books. They say, oh, I know you in this book or that book. And, and all, of, all of the books also include my friends. It, 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 you know, I, I find friends. I put, put my friends in books. We have a, a call from Hopewell, Virginia. Caller, go ahead. Why did you start to write books when you were small? Why did you just start? Well, one thing I was doing uh, when I was very uh, young, I spent uh, as much as one day per week in speech therapy. I had such a very bad speech problem. And so, I, and if any kid laughed at me, you know, punch him out, <laughs> right? And I was always getting into trouble. And so finally a teacher said to me that I could not read in front of a class because I had so many problems. Um, but I could I could write something myself that using only words that I, I could uh, pronounce easily. And I began writing a little poems <coughs> and what have you. And uh, that was my start. Interesting. And poetry, I, I started with poetry because it was easier for me to, to pick up the rhythm of the poem and to get through it. I wouldn't stumble as many times or have to fight as many times. Do you have any recommendations for uh, for writer, for for young people who want to become writers, um, to compete with me. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, w what I've got um, going for myself 
is first I'm a reader. Uh, I've never met a good writer who was not first an excellent reader. Uh, and that gives me, the reading gives me my language skills. The second thing I've got going for myself is discipline. I, I get up and I do the, my seven pages uh, every day. Uh, to make it as a professional writer, the thing I've got, I've got going for myself is uh, dedication to pre-writing. I'm serious with the pre-writing. That's, that's where I make a living. It's interesting. We have a call from Richmond, Virginia now. Caller, go ahead. Uh, yes, Mr. Myers, uh, my name is Lynn Stevens, and I'm calling from Richmond, Virginia. I'd like to know uh, where you were born and raised, where you live now, and where you were educated. Where was I born? Well, I was born in Martinsburg, West Virginia, um, but I was uh, raised in Harlem. I can, you know, I'm, I'm a foster child. And I came to, um, I was sent to Harlem as a three-year-old. I was raised in Harlem. And I went through high school in uh, New York and then uh, dropped out. Um, went back to, to school at the age of 40 to please my father, <laughs> which didn't please my father too much. <laughs> but uh, I tried. <laughs> That's interesting. We have uh, uh, an audience question. Um, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Lindsay Skeens. Um, it said in one of the articles <coughs> that you write just to write and it's not for the money. Now, if, um, if you stopped enjoying writing, would you still want to do it for the money? Yes. <laughs> no, no. I, I write as a hobby. I, I wrote it as a hobby for years before I was, I was ever published. This is what they're, what they're saying. And if I stopped making a living at it, what would I do? Um, sometimes kids ask me, uh, what will I do? When will I retire? Well, when I retire, I'll do my hobby, which is writing. Okay. Um, however, I've also done other, other kinds of jobs. So given a choice of, of the other jobs and writing, writing, rules, baby, <laughs> let me tell you. Well, it seems to offer so many possibilities for you. Um, you get to travel. You get to I get to, to travel. follow your interests. I, I get to meet the, the kids from the middle school here. That's right. It's great. Uh, we have another uh, <coughs> question from our studio audience. Um, what is your favorite? I'm Tom Short. What is your favorite book that you've ever written, and why is it your favorite? Uh... That's hard. That's hard. I like I like Monster. I like Sarah. I like a book called Fallen Angels. Uh, my brother was killed in Vietnam, and I wrote a book about Vietnam, and that was a very moving book for me. So um, they're all my favorites. We now have a caller from Clifton, New Jersey. Caller, go ahead. Hello, my name is uh, Ann Sahani, and uh, you had mentioned that. A, a good writer should be a good reader, and I'd like to know who are your favorite authors, and have they influenced your writing? All right, now the questions are getting hard. Um, <laughs> there was a um, uh, a writer, Juan Ramon Jimenez, <coughs> uh, who I very, very much admire, and who book I I read and reread every couple of couple of years. Uh, I read it aloud because his writing is so very, very simple, and yet the clarity is just is just beautiful, just beautiful writing. Um, James Baldwin, reading James Baldwin, uh, gave me permission to write about my own life. Um, all the books I had in, in high school, um, this 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 teacher gave me. Um, books of, by Balzac, and I, lo I love those books, and I loved all of everything that Balzac wrote in, in high school. That was just moving for me. That's interesting. Are there any contemporary um, writers for young people that you particularly admire? Cynthia Voigt. 
I, I, I love Cynthia Voigt's writing, uh, Dicey's song and, and, and all of her. Uh, um, I, I, Richard Peck. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I so admire his style, uh, uh, Patty Lee Gouch. There, there were, uh, you know, Avi. I, th I, th I think that uh, the blues, jazz, and young adult literature is what America gives to the world. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. We now have an audience question. Uh, I remember early, my name's Thomas Schultz, the second, and I remember earlier in the show that you talked about um, your son's Harlem being different from yours. Can, right. Can you name some of those different things? Uh, yes, I had this nostalgic feeling about this, this place, uh, and I have a tendency to romanticize um, Harlem in my life. <laughs> It's the same way that uh, when I talk about playing basketball, I've played basketball all my life, I kind of romanticized my basketball <laughs> career. I remember all the wins. I don't remember much about the losses. <laughs> uh, but Christopher uh, saw it without, without the romance. It's the same thing with, with, um, with being in the Army. Um, when you see movies, very often you, you romanticize that, that military experience. But when you, when you, uh, first time you, you pick up a dead body and you, and you, and you smell the, you can, all the romanticism comes out. So, so the, the major difference uh, was that I was romanticizing, he's not. So you'll see even the, the, the differences in between the pictures and the text. If you, if you read the text, the text is much more romantic than the pictures. However, my words are better than his pictures. <laughs> <laughs> you can only say that when the illustrator's your son, though. <laughs> right. <laughs> we now have a call f caller from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Yes. Uh, caller? Hello, uh, Mr. D. Myers. Yes. I am a 36-year-old mother of five, and I noticed that you said you got into writing professionally later in life. And I was wondering, how would you recommend um, an older adult to enter into writing? Uh, again, I got into writing professionally uh, later in life. Uh, you have to, to, under, to learn the business. There's a business aspects of writing, uh, which is not always the same as the um, published, where people publish about it. Uh, most writers fail, not because they write badly. Most writers fail because they don't finish the work. They, they don't finish the work. And the secret of the finishing the work is successful pre-writing. That's the secret. Uh, and you have to, to finish the work. And then what I, what I would suggest is that you hook up with a professional writer and use that professional writer as a mentor. There, there are people in Philly, Philadelphia, um, who are um, around. Um, me, write to me, and I, and I can I can tell you how to, how to do it. We have time for um, one more question from the audience. Okay, I was wondering, where did you get your characters for the book Darnell Rock reporting? Oh, um, I was I did a workshop in a in a middle school. And uh, it was a wonderful uh, group of young people. And I used all of these people as my characters in, in Darnell Rock. Excellent. Well, we're just about out of time. Uh, and I'd like to thank Walter Dean Myers for being with us and to the viewing audience from across the country for tuning into the program today. I'd also like to thank the students from Graham Park Middle School for being here in the studio. It's been a pleasure for me and I hope for everyone watching. If you didn't get a chance to ask a question today, you can contact Mr. Myers by using the email address on the screen. That email address is pwnetwk at aol.com. That's pwnetwk at aol.com. We'd love to hear from you and answer your questions. We'd also like you to visit the Kennedy Center and the Prince William Network websites at the addresses on your screen. 
They'll, there you'll find information about upcoming programs as well as other resources on integrating the arts into the curriculum. We'd also like to hear what you think of the Kennedy Center Performing Arts series, so, so we've provided an electronic evaluation form. It's on the Prince William Network website, and we ask that you fill it out so that we can select topics and resources that will enhance your classroom experiences. I'd like, to, I'd like you to remember that our next live performance will be Wednesday, February the 7th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time when Billy Taylor will present Jazz and the Violin with John Blake Jr. on violin. Thank you for visiting with us. And Do we have another studio question? Harlem, a poem by Walter Dean Myers, pictures by Christopher Myers. They took to the road in Waycross, Georgia, skipped over the tracks in East St. Louis, took the bus from Holly Springs, hitched a ride from G's Bend, took the long way through Memphis, the third deck down from Trinidad. A wrench of heart from Gory Island. A wrench of heart from Gory Island to a place called Harlem. Harlem was a promise of a better life, of a place where a man didn't have to know his place simply because he was black. <laughs>